first, then we'll have a break, and then we'll have a panel with uh, Robert Perry on talking about uh, Red Hook's program, uh, Jeff talking about Washington County's program and about North Kingsnet, and uh, Rick talking about um, Chesterfield, New Jersey, which has a very successful TDR program. So the second part of it will be focusing on specific examples. Um, one thing that, that I did want to mention is that <clears throat> we, in Cornwall, we're doing the town plan. I, I co-chair the committee that is trying to deal with our zoning. Uh, one issue when we debated TDRs that came up continually has come up in, in contact with other towns talking to them, is if you get high density, then do you need municipal sewer and water, which many towns don't want to get into. And uh, <clears throat> we went through a long discussion about this, we came up with several techniques which allow you to get, we expect, up to quarter acre lots using existing septic regulations. I'm not going to go into those in detail because uh, Chris Charles, who I think will be here later, has used those techniques in their development in Washington, Connecticut, um, which is in itself a controversial development, but what I want to focus on is the techniques to get uh, very high density under existing regulations. And he'll be here during the break, and he'll have a, a uh, schematic of the MyFields project um, to show you. But just, just if, if that comes up in your minds while, while uh, we're talking today, I want you to know that there's at least a potential way to address that um, that uh, we are working on and, and in fact we hope to get uh, a minor study done, sort of an outline of it, uh, done as part of the Cornwall Town Plan. Um, <clears throat> one other thing I, I want to mention is that uh, in thinking about the seminar and about the reasons for doing it, uh, one of the things that occurred to, has occurred to me almost continually as a member of the Cornwall Planning and Zoning Commission is how we know that we are with details that, that don't get to any of the big questions. Gene's organization put on a great seminar about two years ago in Washington. One of their board members talked about some particular kinds of conservation efforts, and it was a very big audience, all planning and zoning people, um, commissioners, and there were no questions. And usually, when you have that good a presentation, there are questions because people want to know how to implement it. And I was just surprised by this. And I realized that my own reaction was, well, this is great stuff, but we're already so overburdened we can't possibly take on more specific uh, regulatory or um, for innovative techniques to do more. We're just overwhelmed. And uh, I discussed that with Jean, and she felt that was Exactly, that was the reason why there were no questions from this audience. And, and the fact is, I think most commissions are overwhelmed. I feel they're overwhelmed not just by the details, but by the fact that there's really no fabric to fit those details into, in the sense that we really don't have a planning system that's viable. And what I mean by that is not that we're not good at coordinating umpteen details to make sure the subdivisions have all the services and so forth. But for example, that if you look at the growth of land trusts, which is, is I think, pretty startling in terms of how fast they've grown and how many there are, it is really an indication that the planning system doesn't work to preserve land. If you look at how many of us look around our towns and see uh, that, that, that really the landscape is not in any way preserved, that is, most individuals are worried about what their neighbors are going to do with their land. We have no sense of really knowing where the new houses will go or when. That is not a planning system in any normal sense of the word. And, um, and so one of the lines I like to use is that we really have a planning uh, by the Grim Reaper, sort of the Grim Reaper roulette. The new houses will go wherever somebody dies and their children cannot afford to hang on to the land. That's our decision locating where houses will go. And so that leads to the problem that um, we, we don't think about, since, since we don't, most of us know that, but we don't, it's not part of our daily discussion, we don't think about options like TDRs. That, that's probably true, I think, in part because TDRs, at least in my mind, have only recently gotten to the point where they're viable and are working in enough places 
in enough detail so that they really can be put in place by small towns like ours. So that's kind of the genesis of this seminar. But I think if people like people who've come, and, and many of you have talked to, have, have said, we didn't expect, as, as Gene said, we didn't expect to get a lot of people. We knew that the people who came would be the ones who really were going to go back and do something. Um, and, and I think part of doing something will be making the case that our existing system really isn't planning in the sense that it pleases anybody. That, that we don't have a big picture that allows us to uh, solve the major problems. We're so overwhelmed by, by small detail. With that preface, let me say that when we started trying to work on TDRs in Cornwall, uh, we got in touch with, with Rick Prietz, and uh, one of the things, the reasons, I'd say the reason I really wanted to get him here was how effective he was, even in a situation in which we were sitting around a library table with him speaking over a speakerphone, and it was like the kind of situation I remember back when I was a kid listening to ice hockey games over the radio with friends. <laughs> You know, it's just this intense listening, and, and all he had to work with was a speakerphone. No visuals, just his voice. And, and his flexibility and his ability to speak well to questions people ask was uh, just excellent. So with that introduction and one more note, I'd, I'd like to uh, have Rick start. I would say, particularly with a group this small, and if it's okay with Rick, that I'd be really pleased to have people ask uh, questions. You know, I think that would be, as long as they're short and don't go drag Rick way off, but particularly points of information. And in general, during the discussion, I really like to use the one point, one minute rule, which is if you ask a question or have a comment, you make one point and you have a maximum of one minute, because then we keep going around the room much faster. So with that, Rick, I really appreciate your coming. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. District and to co-sponsors, Sharon Association, and Thousand Friends of Connecticut. Uh, thanks to all of you for being here. I know it's, it, as Pat mentioned, it's tough on uh, Thanksgiving weekend to tear yourself away, but uh, I appreciate it. This is my favorite topic. Uh, glad to see that a few other people are interested in as well. Uh, basically, I uh, want to go through just to make sure everyone's up to speed on the mechanics of TDR and then get into uh, what I call the success factors. Um, that may be a little in the weeds, but uh, as your eyes blaze over, I'll adjust accordingly. And then I'll uh, wrap up with uh, just some, some thoughts as to dealing with TDR in rural situations. So to begin, at the beginning, uh, TDR is a market-based tool, and you'll if you don't already know, that, that means that it's got to be satisfactory and a good deal for all parties concerned, or it doesn't work. It works within your zoning code, and it's designed to voluntarily redirect growth away from places that the community wants to save and to places that are appropriate for growth. And the uh, sort of the buzzwords here, this, the area that you want to save is called the sending area. And uh, I'll get into, in just a minute, uh, the various kinds of sending areas, but they could be environmentally sensitive areas, farmland, historic landmarks, a lot of things. The receiving areas, uh, the areas that you want to grow, uh, are usually, but not always, areas that are located near existing development. So they're also usually near existing jobs and schools and shopping and infrastructure or can be served by infrastructure, but not always, and I'll get to that in a minute too. So I like to explain this in sort of a, a terms of, imagine you have dual zoning, uh, and that the property owners have a choice in what way they go with that zoning. Under dual zoning, the Senate, uh, by the way, I apologize, uh, the good news is that we got the projected work. <laughs> the bad news is that it's cutting off the top and the right of the uh, screen. So if there's anything uh, that, that is just uh, indecipherable because of that, please stop me and I'll, I'll be sure to let you, uh, fill in the gaps. Um, but looking at just that sending area, again, the area that you want to save, uh, the property owner has a choice. The property owner can say, I'm not interested in permanently preserving my land. I just want to use my land as allowed by the underlying zoning. Fine, no problem. 
However, if the property owner wants to